you mentioned in, in terms of like working on this outside of like you know a tournament game you mentioned like analyzing your games is probably the best thing you can do mm. right to like kind of understand your psychology a bit better hmm. um are there other things people can do to let's say try to improve this this aspect of their game and is it just mental aspects like you know like your confidence your mood or is it other things um as well let me bring up an example a lot of people have anxiety about like the rating and the results and, and mm. they don't play if they feel like the rating might go down or yeah, all this me. stuff where <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean myself <laughs> myself as well i think we, we all feel it from from time to time some some less or more than others um yeah any any tips or advice on on dealing with that um i mean i i i don't want to um stand here and uh <laughs> and pretend <laughs> that I'm an expert on that um, because, um, you know, that, that would be disingenuous. I, I struggle with that as, as much as anyone else struggles with it. And it's pretty silly at like a 2000 level. It's just sort of like, you know, but I remember again, you know, talking to Boris and I asked him once and I was just like, you know, what, you know something about that and he was like what are you going to do with those points <laughs> what are you just like what are you going to cash them in at a, at a casino and get point in money for them or something like <laughs> you, they're they're not they don't mean i mean they're what are you what are what do they mean that you're not going to cash them in and you know go go out to dinner with them they don't you know what i mean so yeah. uh you know i thought that was really interesting kind of a I think about that a lot, you know, just sort of like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm just putting way too much pressure on myself. I, I, I mean, it may be for, for, for your level, it's a little different because maybe in some ways it, it, it is monetarily associated because you have, you know, prestige and, and all that kind of stuff. But at my level, it's really kind of silly for me to be worrying about that kind of stuff. And um, the other thing that, that, um, that um, I have found personally to be helpful and also, um, you know, um, you you had um, uh, GM Ramesh on the show, mm -hmm. um, and I thought um, his podcast for anyone who who uh, hasn't s s heard that podcast is really really good, and I thought that he was really good about about that talking about your own process and making it about your own process. Um, I, th I thought that was really kind of interesting um, to be, you know, and, and what, what that is in, 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 in sports psychology, right, is, 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 is being process oriented versus goal oriented. And I'm very goal oriented, right? Mm -hmm. But, but hey, wait a second, you know, there's the process, you know, and then there's the goal and the short term goals and long term goals. And um, so what, uh, what I, what I, try to do um, is to uh, really when I finally get myself to the playing hall, which is not often, is to focus on the process, uh, which I think is the, you know, again, you know, your, 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 your dojo training program addresses, it's about playing, you know, you have to play what at my level, there's like, I think I'm supposed to play and annotate 75. I don't think I have in 10 years, I've played 75 games. <laughs> so I'm supposed to play and annotate 75 games, um, which, I, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But, um, you know, that, that, that's the process, you know, that, that, I think that's the point that you're, you're making um, by focusing on that. You're really, helping people think yeah I, I guess our idea is that like you know the difference between um someone being at their current level and then being at a higher rating um the distance there is just a matter of work rather than time so it's not a matter of time like if they don't put in the mm -hmm. work but if they put in the work then regardless of how long it takes or how quickly then the idea is that the improvement um should come hopefully that's that's kind of like the certainty that we're trying to offer to people it's like if you, mm -hmm. if you put in the work then i think so i think your 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 training plans are fantastic oh thanks For appreciate sure. it <laughs> yeah 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 no i do um 
so yeah, there's there's a lot we can go into. Uh, I would love to ask you about mind reading in chess. Um, I've definitely felt like occasionally I can kind of sense what my opponent is thinking. And sometimes you literally just catch their eyes on a square and you figure out their idea, um, right. which I, th- I think is a real is a real thing. Um, so, yeah, can you elaborate a bit on that? Like, what are your what are your thoughts on on mind reading? Um, you know, I think in 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 old school Russia, there was a lot more of that idea than there is today because Boris I mean I remember remember from the old days I mean there's that famous picture of um Benko I think with in sunglasses or someone mm-hmm. was in sunglasses because they thought they were against tall some, I think I think yeah. yeah against tall and then there was in the Korchnoi um uh, Korsh- Karpov. Karpov match there was like a hypnotist and you know there's a lot of kind of weird stuff yeah going around I don't think you know western psychologists give that much thought or credence or anything like that I certainly uh I mean I remember Boris telling me those types of stories and I was like really <laughs> it's like, uh it's sort of mystical you know, kind of stuff that's not, um, but I mean, I think there are, um, I think there are ways that people um, do some kind of mind reading, Uh, you know, like, as you were saying, you catch them looking at a square and then you can say, Oh, wait a second. Um, I remember Boris telling me, um, a story um, about when he played, when he was in a, a game against Korchnoi, and and it was um, that he he told after the game they had in their post mortem that um, he uh, Korchnoi told Boris that that he had missed something in his calculations, and, and Boris was like, "How do you know?" He says, "Well, you sacrificed a pawn." And then you thought for 20 minutes. <laughs> you say, That's not how it works. You sacrifice a pawn, you should have an idea or a reason for, <laughs> for why you sacrificed it. And uh, so, I mean, I think that there are things like that. And, they, and, I, and I remember hearing, you know, like uh, the commentators on tournaments and stuff say stuff like that. What? Why is he? Why all of a sudden he's thinking? Right. Um, he, he shouldn't be thinking now. He should have been thinking the, the move before. Which is a, I guess, a sign that you, you miss something in your, in your thinking. Yeah, Leiko in particular is great when he's doing commentary. He, I think he can right. just sense exactly like, like why a player is pausing, what kind of lines they're calculating. You just really get into their, um, their mind, which, which makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're you're seeing the same position, so you can kind of understand, uh, someone's perspective. Um, the eye contact thing is really interesting because yeah, that's something that I think. You kind of see more um, at higher levels, or maybe you used to see it more often. Um, and I feel like it, it does make a difference. There are definitely players who will straight up look at you um, mm-hmm. when they're not sure if you blundered upon or if you're sacrificing it, and they'll just stare right. at you and try to figure it out, like whether you feel confident or not, and um, that can really affect their their decision. Um, which yeah, is, and the Pomniachi always looks at people, right? You see him. Uh, yeah. yeah 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 he he definitely does and um he does another thing that um i think fewer people do um which is he makes like reaction faces when someone mm-hmm. makes a move and right. uh, that can actually be quite um quite annoying uh, i'll say for me i had one or two experiences where my opponent um i don't know if it was like intentional or, or whatever but um was just kind of like making odd faces after i made a move mm-hmm. and um it it was definitely very bothersome. It made me feel real self conscious about, mm-hmm. about my moves, mm-hmm. um, especially because like, you know, some of the moves were just like book moves. <laughs> uh-huh. So it was like I knew it was the right move. I knew it's like totally fine. But he's still looking at me funny. So I'm like, what what is he? Do- <laughs> what, what's happening here? So it was very confusing. 
this should be five in the Moscow variation of the Sicilian. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> Raise the eyebrow. Um, yeah, I feel like Kasparov as well was famous for um, reacting a bit to uh, to the opponent's moves. Um, yeah, what are well, your he, thoughts on yeah, that? He was he was all over the place, right? You could you see exactly what I mean, Nakamura too, right? Mm-hmm. Nakamura, yeah. they're all they just wear their hearts out on their sleeves, right? Yeah, they, some of them can't. Um, they just can't help it, no. and uh, just kind of maybe even helps them in in some way. Um, I mean, I, I definitely, as a psychologist, do a lot of that. I do a, a ton of behavior analysis, uh, not the technical version that people do, but the, uh, you know, psychotherapy version, you know, seeing how people are sitting and holding themselves and where they're looking and, you know, how they're talking. And every, I mean, everything, every, every piece of it is scrutinized. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's similar. You're trying to get all, all pieces of information from your, from your opponent. Do you mean and, during uh, the game you'll you'll psychoanalyze them? <laughs> I do, well, but not, but that's because it's my strength, right? So I mean, I, I'm I not psychoanalyze because I need somebody to talk usually, but you know, but I'll I I spend a lot of time thinking about the psychology of their moves. You know, again, it's 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 a strength of mine, and I definitely fall into the, you know, what's the I play Gligorich, I, I I play against pieces or something. I definitely don't play against pieces. I play against people, for right. sure. Um, but I, I don't think I'm good enough really to play against either pieces or people. But <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like I I think they're people that fall into these camps, right? Yeah, play yeah, like for a, sure. A, a play kind of objective best chess I, I i always think about this right like going back to playing weaker players or 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 stronger players and do you play do you play theoretically um critical chess and or do you sort of try to play like a super solid game and you know that kind of thing and i remember i was listening to jan gustafsson talk about playing lower rated players and he was like, yeah, I should really play the Sicilian, but he's an E5 expert. And so he ends up having to struggle sometimes mm-hmm. in, uh, in in kind of dryish positions. Yeah. But he was like, why can't I just play the Sicilian? You know, that's what I really should do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Very, very common struggle when, when playing down as black. And it's like, you got to, like, they're strong enough to, to punish you if you play something you're not super familiar with. So... Yeah, it is kind of um, it's an interesting. I like Fabi for that for that point because I I play very solidly and I take I take solace in the fact that he just outplays people from solid positions. He plays e five, plays a Petrov, and he's still gonna just play figure out some way to outplay you. And he's just looking for that one little slip, that one little nuance, and all of a sudden you see that computer starts you know that evaluation mark <laughs> goes up one little piece at a time you know right yeah five and then it's point eight and then it's and then it's like it's game over at that point he's definitely someone that i feel like is playing more uh, against the pieces like kind of like more oh for sure objective yeah, yeah. oh absolutely absolutely um, yeah uh, whereas um you know someone like magnus actually i would put maybe more in the people camp like he's yeah. kind of thinking more about his opponent and um yeah, it's been said that Magnus somehow has a way of just kind of getting his opponents to to make mistakes. Um, yeah. Which which makes me feel like there's something like under the surface there where he, he's just kind of sensing the direction they want to go and then and then setting a trap for them uh down the line. Um so. Yeah, I, I think Cortnoy said that there are three people that can read your thoughts, Tall, Mecking, and Carlson. Oh, very interesting. I don't know Mekin, but I tall and awesome. yeah, I know of Mekin. Um, right, right. He he was uh, super talented. Um, that, that that's a very interesting three uh, trio. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, right. It's not the trio you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember when Korshner someone was saying that that they essentially feel like Magnus is hypnotizing um, his opponents. 
Well, yeah, I mean, there was, I mean, there, there's, I, I remember watching some, many games like that and, and one game in particular where it was just a draw and the announcers, you know, they're commenting on it, how this is just a draw. And, and it's like, yeah, but it's Magnus and he's going to, and people, and, and Fabi says that he's like, people just fall on their swords against him. <laughs> it's mm. like, and he doesn't understand why <laughs> he's mm. just like, you know, why, why do they keep doing that? You know? And, and, and sure enough, there's like an equal position, equal ending. And, and I think, I think there's just this, this, I think it's really a psychological that, you know, that he's going to do his thing. Yeah, do you think at this point he himself just has an effect on people just because yeah, he's done I, it so I think, many yeah, times? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think he's got just you know unbelievable confidence, and he's going to play until there are two kings left on the board, and he's going to play every conceivable trick that you can possibly come up with, and you know that, and you just like I don't have the psychological stamina or energy to do that. I don't think people do. I think that that's my my interpretation is that people don't have the the the, the 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 very few people have this, this the psychological strength and the energy to um to uh to withstand that you know mm -hmm. yes okay now i gotta sit here for two hours and like grind away with this guy that just really likes to do this <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna throw everything at me and then lo and behold you make some inaccuracy and he's gone you know yeah He's won so many games like that. Yeah. No, so many sure. games. I've watched them online and, you know, with commentators going bananas, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. And every time it's like, it, it gets worse. <laughs> it's like, right. there's no way. <laughs> right. Here he goes again. Right. Exactly. Um, on the other hand, I do feel like having had to defend against Magnus all these years, a lot of the top players have improved because of it. Because now they've kind yeah. of gotten this, uh, this practice um well they know they know it's coming right yeah like yeah. i mean i think that's f famously ex exemplified by karyakin in their first in that world championship match right mm -hmm. remember that game I, I don't remember the game but i remember him defending unbelievable position yeah. just playing some incredible chess defensive right. chess where he was really kind of worse i think right he was losing or something I remember, and he was yeah. able to just like magically defend. Yeah, no, it's definitely yeah one of those positions. Or uh, there was multiple games where it seemed like Magnus should win like most of the time, but yeah, um, yeah he just showed just fantastic defensive skill. Really, really. And it's interesting because that, that's like you know. So if we think about, we go back to to um, this kind of issue about losing winning positions. And having the energy and the stamina and the strength and the confidence to to withstand that, you know, he's sitting there going, yeah, but I'm really good at this. <laughs> right? Like Magnus is saying, I'm really good at this. Karyak can say, yeah, I'm really good at this too. All right? Like he he's able to to bring some, to match him a little bit. He was able to match that that energy and that strength and that confidence that, yeah, I can defend very difficult positions. Right, and he's known for that. And then, very interestingly, that kind of tilted Magnus. He ends up over pushing right. and then losing a game that right. normally exactly. yeah, doesn't seem like he would. Right. Um, yeah, no, really interesting case there. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, okay. I wanted to ask you. You mentioned like writing um, lessons with the grandmaster was was really helpful for your chess, which yeah. I yeah, can imagine. Um, how about this book? Do you feel like this has this has helped you in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think so. There are two two huge takeaways, right? Mm -hmm. One, so I'll, and I, I can explain. I can try to explain the lesson with the Grandmaster uh, uh, series was um, really helpful because so we have an idea in psychoanalysis called introjection, and what happens in the analytic situation is. Um, that the patient interjects, right, brings into their mind the analyst. And so they then, after some time, are kind of walking around the world with their analyst in their head, right? 
So you no longer by yourself, you're with your analyst thinking about stuff and reflecting on things. And I think that's the single most important piece that's not talked about in you know chess literature um, uh, on any podcast or anything. I, mean, I don't think it's like a concept that, that's out there so much. But basically what was so um, apparent to me was that I had this really strong player on my shoulder and I would be in games and I would literally just be there, well, what would Boris do? <laughs> well, he would never do that. There's no way. I remember one game, I did it anyway. <laughs> didn't get out of my own way but i knew i was sitting there having an argument with boris over the board right i'm sitting there and i'm like no there's no way boris would do this there's think of any move on the chessboard think of anything make every legal possible move find one that's not the one you want to play i wanted to play put my rook from e8 on like d8 behind my pawn on d7 in a in an end game, it was like the worst move. You, could, you can't like bury your rook any more than you can uh -huh. possibly do it in that position. And I ended up in a horrible position. I think I managed to win in time trouble, blah, blah, blah. But it was like the worst, one of my worst moves in chess. And I remember so well that conversation. And I had many conversations like that because you just have this interject now in your mind that changes how you look at the board. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, am I really going to make that move? Nah, Boris would never make that move. He just wouldn't. <laughs> and you know it. So you, you have, the, and I think, I think there's the chess piece of improving by looking at Grandmaster games, but I think that there's a psychological piece that um, was clear in my writing these books with Boris that came, that was true for me. And I think that's what happens when you study a book um, consistently right so you're not just like jumping around but you're really like i'm gonna i'm working on ayakin's games and i'm gonna do the whole book mm. and like boris would tell me like just study ayakin's games if you want to play more aggressively just just study ayakin's games the first half before he becomes champion mm. right first half of the book he's amazing he's amazing just watch how every threat is responded to with an equal or stronger threat there is not a single move in any of those games where he backs down or he tries to, you know, you know, just like, you know, go for something quiet or whatever. He's just, you make a threat and all of a sudden it's like out of nowhere, I'm going to sacrifice a bishop on H7. <laughs> it's like, where, where did that come from? <laughs> and he does that all the time, right? And so that's what his thought was. You know, hey, you want to get more aggressive, play, go through the first half of the book. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. I've I've had that experience when I'm going through books, uh, like the, uh, Cheryl's book, Fire and Board, and by the end, you just mm -hmm. feel like you kind of have this energy um, within you. I also had it with um with my coach Var Akobian for many years, um, but it was it was a little bit of like you know what would what would Var do in the position, but there was also some accountability because I knew that whatever move I played. I would then have to go show the move uh, to VAR <laughs> that I played right. in that position. So if it was right. a really controversial move, I definitely would think think a lot before before making it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that's definitely kind of an interesting um, interesting help that, that you can have during uh, during your game. And so you mentioned yeah. two takeaways, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So the second one, but I think that's a really really important one, especially for. People that they're that are improving, they want to they want to study and get better. I think that that and I and I like again going back to your training plan. I really like um, I really like the idea of picking like a book or a couple of books, right? And you have for each level, at least for the level that I'm at, you have a book. I'm not happy with the book, <laughs> but it's a book, and it's you know obviously it's a book that you all think is great, right? And there's going to be some consequence of reading a book like that, right? And 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 one of the consequences I can imagine is improving analytical ability. That's one of the things that I want, you know, that that um, that particular chess player is known for, mm -hmm. you know. And you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna sort of take that in, you know, by going over 
steadily and consistently, you're going to start to interject the teacher's voice and the teacher's the way of thinking, you know, and that's what that's what happens in psychotherapy. And that's what happens, I think, in, in these kinds of situations. So I think that's a huge piece that that it's not just like I'm getting better because I'm moving my pieces around. There's a better player in your head mm-hmm. and you have access to that person, which is a big deal. Um, the second piece, the second takeaway was um, in, in the second for the Analyzing the Chess Mind book, um, the takeaway for me was the sporting nature of chess. So I am really attracted to chess, not for the sporting nature of chess. Like I have no interest in it. I don't care to see, I don't, attacking chess makes no sense to me. Um, I'm not interested in it. I don't like swindles. I could care less if you sacrifice a piece and it's worse and you're worse, but your opponent blunders because they get confused or or they get intimidated. None of that interests me whatsoever. Um, But a beautiful end game and I will watch it all day long and I love it and it's beautiful. And I and I I, I remember Smyslov in, in his book talks about um, the truth in the chessboard, and I really love that idea. Like the chessboard is like the chess, the game of chess. There's like truth in this sort of microcosm of a universe, and uh, and and I feel like that about sort of the theoretical aspect of it. So I really am drawn to the academic side and the the the, the end games and those types of things. Um, whereas the the uh, the aggressive piece and the not the aggressive piece, but just the the sporting piece, right? Like if you're losing, resign, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so I think that this book made it so much more clear to me that that was a huge piece and is a huge piece that's missing from my my game that I need to improve. Um, and and so the whole book is about the whole book is sports psychology. Really, it's about right. not so much chess related stuff. I mean, it's all chess related stuff, but there's a thinking process behind it that is, um, w- you know, that was not co- that that was not so um, clear to me. You know, I didn't I didn't appreciate it and didn't like it. I, didn't, I wasn't interested in it. And now and now I'm like, I really need to appreciate that part. That's a huge part of it. You know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of like, um, improving your your chess like skill and and rating. Yeah, I think those factors are super important, and they often come from experience, which is why it's like a lot of people feel like playing is super important because that's the only it's the only time you like really get tested, and it's like it's psychologically difficult. It's not the same as like a training game where you know if you lose, like no big deal. It's like it's different when there's stakes on. On the line and you still have to try to be objective and find the best move and um well even just just being able to uh keep your cool when you're low on time is already mm-hmm. extremely difficult um uh and and then there's like the added pressure on on top of that um so yeah i mean it feels like uh the psychological elements definitely like can't be under underestimated um but, uh, that's what Ayakin said. Oh, really? Yeah, he said that was the most important factor in chess. Oh, the interesting. Very, very first line of the book. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I always you know, laugh when um, people quote like Fisher. You know, like I don't believe in psychology. I believe in good news. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I don't know. He did believe in psychology. He would always write about like crushing the opponent's ego and like. Right you know, not back, backing down from a challenge. And so <laughs> I think I think it affected him sure. quite more than, than maybe he oh, gave sure. credit for. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and he was, he was, I mean, I could go on and on for about Fisher, but um, cause he's an interesting case study, but um, and one day I'll write a book about him, but um, you know, uh, he, he, he was, he had tremendous confidence on the board but he didn't have tremendous confidence all of the time. He he, he uh, had, you know, that's one of the reasons he couldn't get to the match, mm-hmm. right? You know, and there was also um, um, one interzonal tournament where he left the interzonal tournament famously, right? Or infamously, right? So, so he yeah, was kind absolutely. of a, an interesting character. I mean, we know that, but 
but in that regard as well. Yeah. Um, well, Rachel, thanks. This has been uh, super interesting. Um, once again, we'll have links uh, to the book in the show notes and on YouTube. Um, but uh, great to hear from you. Um, I can't Thank wait you. to read the book myself. I think it, it looks super interesting. Uh, do you have any more plans? Any more books or taking a break? I'm I'm not with Boris, but I am working on a a, a new book. Um, I'm again the same idea. Um, I'm um, the same idea of kind of working with a specific person to learn about. Uh, I'm trying to address my own problem of the opening, and I want to work on middle game positions. And um, so I started to. Um, uh, propose a project to work on a, a book with the Grandmaster Keith Arco. And oh, um, cool. we're going to study, uh, well, we have, we have, I'm writing the book. It's, it's, we're done with the lessons now. But basically, it's um, uh, his Carol Can games, um, mm -hmm. trying to learn how he kind of approaches the, uh, basically, the middle game positions arising out of the Carol Can. Um, oh, I see. So I mean, they're they're it's structured in like opening repertoire format, right? So like exchange Carol Can, advance Carol Can, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really what the book is about. The book is about how does he approach the middle game structures? What kind of middle game structures is he going for? What is he you know, um, you know, what does he like? What is, how does he understand them? And what's he going for? And then how he executes um his his game plan and i you know i uh again you know it's another one of those things where i feel quite confident playing Cairo ken games because of because i've studied that not i don't theory i don't really understand i mean I'm so well but the um uh, i feel very comfortable in the structure and i think that comes from again like uh Trying to take, I'm trying to take advantage of of this idea, you know, that I was talking about earlier about the interjection. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll I'll look forward to to reading it for sure. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thanks again, Joel, for for coming on. Uh, this was really interesting. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I wish you all the best, and um, that'll do it for the stream, folks. So until next time, take care. Stop.